Charlie Kirk and Turning Point USA. Big round of applause. Also, Sophia Witt, she's doing an amazing job. Sophia Witt, yes, yes, yes. It's really, really nice coming from South Florida to be in a group of so many young, like-minded Hebrews and Shebrews and gender-neutral Zebrews. <laughs> we cater to all. We cater to all. I want to talk today a little bit about positive thinking and maintaining a positive attitude. Because in our society, there's a lot of negativity, and one of the things that's a big challenge for us as individuals, in particular in the Jewish community, in particular in the conservative Jewish community, is maintaining a positive attitude, being positive, staying positive. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the mechanics of positive thinking. Sound like fun? All right. How it works. Yeah, yeah. So one of the fundamental ideas of our faith is that there's more to reality than meets the eye. There's the realm of action, and we're well aware that when I do an action, that Jewish mysticism teaches that if a person does something positive in the world, not only does it uplift themselves, it uplifts the entire world around them. And vice versa, when a person does something physically that is negative, that there's a negative impact in the universe around them as well. Let's take it a step back to the realm of speech as well, because speech is something that has more impact sometimes than we give it credit. In Judaism, there's, there's a law against speaking bad against other people. And it says that when you speak bad against another person, it hurts three people. The one who spoke it, the one who it's spoken against, and the person that it's spoken about. Now, I understand the one who spoke it, Lush and Hara, so someone who said something bad about somebody, that it's bad on the speaker because they shouldn't be speaking about those things. I understand that it's bad on the listener because they shouldn't be listening to that type of thing. But what about the one who it was spoken about? Why is that considered that, it, that, it's, that it's bad on them as well? If they never find out about it, what's the big deal? Because Jewish tradition teaches that our speech itself carries meaning, carries, carries influence, and that just by speaking bad about someone, you help lower them down. There's a story about the Baal Shem Tov, the, the founder of the Hasidic movement, and he was in his synagogue one day, and, and two gentlemen in the, in the synagogue after services got into an argument, and one of them got so upset that he said, I'm going to tear you apart like a fish. And everyone's like, whoa, right? And so the Baal Shem Tov gathered everyone in a circle, told them to put their arms on each other's shoulders, and guided them through a slow meditation, said, close your eyes. And everyone in the room began to shriek because what they saw transpiring was this individual actually tearing the other individual apart like a fish. Because on some level, somewhere in the ether, when we say things, it makes a difference, it makes an impact, even in our physical world. There was a study about 15 years ago by Dr. Uh, Masaru Emoto, a Japanese, uh, Japanese doctor, and um, he did this ice crystal study. In the ice crystal study, he, they took water from a stream, they, and they, they divided it up into two cups. In one cup, they had a group of people saying good things over it. You're so cool. You're so good looking. You're so wonderful. Please, thank you. All these nice things. And then the other cup, with the same water, they had negative stuff. You're so stupid. You're so ugly. All sorts of negative stuff. And they poured the water, the individual water, into a Petri dish and then froze it at negative 25 degrees Celsius. And then they looked at the ice crystals through a magnification about 300 times. And what they saw was that the ones where positive things were said over it, it was perfectly symmetrical. The ice crystals were beautiful. Beautiful. They were beautiful. <laughs> When, when, when they looked at the negative ones, the, the, the ice crystals where negativity had been set over it, it was all jagged, misaligned. And so, again, I don't want to get into the, the details of how much, we should adhe you know, how much we should give credence to the study, That's, but just the fact that in secular society, they're giving credence to the idea that our words carry meaning and bring energy to the universe, that's a really powerful thing. Now, what about thought? You know, I spoke to a cardiologist friend of mine, and he told me, and he's, very, he's a secular guy, he's a Jewish guy, but lives a fairly secular lifestyle. 
And he told me about a very interesting study that he had just encountered where children who had terminal illness were put into this, um, not, not really a test, but they were, they were told to play Pac-Man. Remember, remember the game Pac-Man? Right, on your phones, you know, Pac-Man, little chompy guy, goes around, chomps, little munchy things. And so they told, they told the children that while you're playing Pac-Man, we want you to imagine that you're Pac-Man and that the little chompy things are your disease. And every time that you chomp the disease, your disease is going away. And they found that those children that participated in this little practice, this little experiment, did significantly better than they did before they played the game. Just their thoughts being in the right place influenced their actual reality. Their mind affected their personal health. It's an amazing thing. And so there's, in the last 10 years, 20 years, there's been a, a book and a whole like, movement called The Secret where if you put something out into the universe, that if you want it and think about it hard enough, if this is what you really want, that that'll come back to you. Somehow, some way, somehow, that'll come back to you. And so where does Judaism fit in with all of this? Where does, where does Torah ideology fit in with all of this? One of the interesting things, you know, in, in general, having any type of positive thoughts in our mind, going, walking, ma marching through life with any sort of positivity is always helpful. But for a Jew... It says, Ein tov el Torah. The greatest type of good that we can have in our mind is like a Torah mentality, a morality, a godly mentality. And so in the Torah text, in the Bible, and using the biblical model, you have the story of Joseph. And Joseph's brothers ostensibly were jealous of him. And they, they were, he was the favorite child. He was considered, the, you know, he got a little special coat. And the brothers didn't like him, and they decided to throw him in a pit what, and let nature take its course. And so what the Torah says, when it describes the pit, it says the, Torah was e the, the pit was empty, there was no water in it. The, the, the pit was empty, there was no water in it. Well, that's a bit redundant. That should be sent to the Department of Redundancy Department. That, the, the pit being empty, if I know the pit is empty, I know there's no water in it. So whenever the Torah has something that appears redundant, it means look there, there's some lesson to be learned, something influential to your life. So the Medrash says the reason that it's, what does it mean when it says the pit was empty, there was no water in it, this seeming redundancy? It says it was empty of what pits normally have in it, which is water, but it was filled instead with snakes and scorpions. And the lesson is really valuable to us in our own lives because our mind is like the pit. Torah, or positivity, is, is the water. It's the ref refreshing flow of wisdom, energy, life. If our pit, if our brain is not filled with water, if it's not filled with positivity, it's not filled with godliness and goodness, the natural result is going to be snakes and scorpions. The choice is ours. If we want to fill it with good stuff, that's what's going to be. But if you don't, if you don't make the active effort to do so, Snakes and scorpions. And a lot of times, talk to people about their life and about their outlook in life, and they say, you know, I'm a really negative person. I'm naturally a negative person. How can I get all the snakes and scorpions out of my head, the muck, the gunk that's, that's infiltrated my brain? How can I beat off this negativity? Get rid of it. So... The answer is, you don't have to fight negativity. You just have to add water. You don't have to fight off the snakes and scorpions. You got to add water. A few years ago, in the summer, we had a little baby. We have five, thank God, five kids at home. Yeah, five kids. <laughs> All right. So, thank you. We had, our youngest was one, it was one at the time, and we had one of those swimming pools, one of those plastic swimming pools that you can like buy at Walmart or the supermarket. And we had it in our backyard. Anytime the little one-year-old wanted to go play, that's, we didn't put her in the big pool. We put her in, we filled up the little pool. And so when, when the pool wasn't being used, my other kids liked to throw all sorts of garbage in it. They put nails and 
dirt and muck and gunk and rocks and whatever they could find, they put it into that little swimming pool. And so one time, it was filled with all sorts of muck and gunk and rocks and whatever. And my wife's like, oh, our, the baby wants to use the pool. Why don't you go fill up the pool? And so I walked over to the pool, and it looked like a sandbox at the time. It was filled with gunk and muck and rocks and all sorts of things. And I, look, and I tried to lift it, and I know what all you're thinking. When you look at me, you say, that is one buff rabbi. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's the usual reaction. That's the usual reaction. Um, so I tried to lift it, and it was really high. I couldn't lift it, right? That's how heavy it was. Exactly. So I tried lifting, and I couldn't lift it. And so I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? So I did what any of us would do. I took the hose, stuck it right into the thing, turned the hose on. Five minutes later, the thing's completely cleared out, right? All the muck and gunk, just it filled with water. The water just kept coming in and coming in, and all the gunk was out. So the, the, the object of, of, of our life of filling our mind, of getting positive. It's not about fighting off negativity, getting rid of the snakes and scorpions and the gunk and the muck in our brains. It's just adding water, adding positivity, surrounding ourselves with positive environments, reading positive things, looking at positive things. Because if we let the negativity in, it's not a good result. There's a, there's a story that's told of one of our great sages, Rabbi Akiva, now, I know what you're thinking. It's like, oh, he's going to go into a Talmudic story. Boring. No, don't worry. Keep listening. The story is of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva would travel around from town to town. And he, would talk, he would talk to the, those people in each village. And he came to a town one time. Under, in that time, the land of Israel was, uh, was being dominated by the Romans. And so Rabbi Akiva was going around and he was trying to find lodging for the night. That's where he was, that's where he was going to set up shop that night. So he knocks on the first door, says, Hi, I'm Rabbi Kiva. Do you think you can have a spot for me to, to sleep tonight? So, no, nah, one excuse after the next, right? Uh, the in laws are in town, the room's under construction, whatever it was. He went door to door asking for lodging. No one couldn't find a place to sleep. And so what happened was he decided he's going to go sleep in the field, right? That's, that's, well, you got to do what you got to do. Now, Rabbi Akiva would always travel with a rooster so that he could wake up on time. He'd always travel with a donkey to schlep his things and with a candle so that he could study even in the evening. And so when he goes out to the field, he sets up shop, he's going to camp for the night. All of a sudden, a gust of wind blows his candle out. Great. Rabbi Akiva had a mantra that he lived by. Rabbi Akiva, you would live by the mantra, kol ma da'avid rachman latav avid. Everything God does, he does for good. It's all good. So when the, when the wind blew out his candle, it's all good. Everything God does, he does for good. A few minutes later, fox comes along, eats his rooster. Great. Just great. Right? But Rabbi Akiva had a mantra. Everything God does, he does for good. No problem. A few minutes later, lion comes along and eats his donkey. Well, this is just great. But Rabbi Akiva had a mantra, kol da'avid rachman al-tav avid, everything God does, he does for good. He went to sleep, whatever. The morning after, he looks and he, that the he finds that the town that he had been seeking lodging in was completely ransacked by the Romans. People were beaten, murdered, raped. And if he had found lodging there, he would have been a part of it. And if the Romans would have come and they would have seen his light in the field or his donkey would have heard the commotion and he hawed, he would have been a victim as well. So Rabbi Akiva lived by that mantra and he recognized the called David Rahman, everything, everything that happens is for the good. We may not see it so much in the, while we're going through it, but in the grand scheme of things, everything works out the way that it needs to work out. I want to talk to you a little bit about the, how the mechanics of how this works. That when, when I think of something positive, and how when you think of something positive, how it actually leaves a positive influence in the world. There's a spiritual mechanics of how this whole thing works. Spiritual, the spiritual mechanics go like this. The world exists in multiple dimensions, right? So a one-dimensional object is just a dot, right? Two-dimensional object is, has length, and it has width, length and width, right? Every picture you've ever seen, Every painting you've ever seen is all a two-dimensional object, right? Pac-Man, the chompy guy, two-dimensional. 
So if you're living in two-dimensional worlds, you can't imagine that there's a third dimension, right? You're just in the world of length and width. To imagine that there's a third dimension, you can all, there's also depth. It's completely beyond our realm of thought. But there is. And the third dimension is what we all live in, where there's length, where there's width, and where there's depth. We live in a 3D world. Now, what would it look like if you could live in the fourth dimension? If you could put, if you found four-dimensional glasses, like, whoa, look, I just found two four-dimensional glasses on. What would the world look like? The, the, the fourth dimension is time. And so what you would see, if you could see with glasses from the fourth dimension, is everything that has ever happened in time from the beginning until the end all happening in one simultaneous moment. So if I looked at you, or you looked at me with four-dimensional glasses, you would see everything from my beginning until my end, right, from womb to tomb, happening in one consecutive, mo in, one, in one, con one, one solid moment. All happen Our brain can't wrap its head around this because we live in a 3D world. But if we lived in 4D world, if we could see in four, with 4D glasses, then we would see, oh, everything from the beginning all the way until the end, all happening in one simultaneous moment. Everything in the timeline of history, if you looked at the world around, everything in the timeline of history, everything from the, from the beginning of time until the end of time, all happening at one simultaneous moment. Whoa. Now we're going to take this to the fifth dimension because after that our heads explode. What would it look like if you could look at the world with 5D glasses on? So like we said, four-dimensional world means everything from the beginning of time to the end of time, the whole timeline of history, everything that ever happened and everything that ever will happen all happening at one simultaneous moment. What would 5D glasses look like? 5D glasses is that at every moment there is a potential of what could have happened, right? There's only one thing that actually transpires, but at any moment... An infinite amount of other things could have happened, right? And so with 5D glasses on, not only would you see everything that actually transpired from the beginning of time until the end of time, but you'd see every potential that actually could have happened happening as well. Now, only one thing can actually happen, but there is a place, right? Only one thing can happen in the physical world in the realm of action. But there is a place where all potential realities, you have access to all potential realities. Where is that? In your thoughts. In my thoughts, I have access to 5D living. All the potential realities. And when I focus my attention on one of those potential realities, I'm excluding one of those potential realities out of all the infinite amount of possibilities and making that one, bringing that one closer to material reality. And so this is the mechanics, the spiritual mechanics of how it works. That by just thinking positively about something, or just by envisioning something in a certain direction, you make it more likely because you single it out out of all the potential realities to come and manifest in the physical world. I'm going to uh, conclude with a, a short story and sort of tie it into the Turning Point mission and all of our missions here. If you haven't been listening until now, or so th this, this story, I, I believe, may sum it up a little bit. There's a story of a gentleman who finished out his time in this world. Right? We'll call him Mr. Epstein. Right? Jewish crowd, Epstein, not bad, right? <laughs> so... He was sitting in heaven's waiting room, ready to go into, ready to see what, where his afterlife is going to be. And he's sitting in the waiting room, and the angel who's taking attendance calls out and says, okay, Epstein, you lived a great life. Welcome to heaven. So Mr. Epstein is very excited, very happy. He's like walking past, the, walking past the angel, but he says, you know what, angel, I have a small request for you. Would you mind just, can you just show me the other place? I don't want to go there. I don't want to stay there. But can you show me you know where downstairs? And so the angel's like, well, you know, I've never had this request before. But you know what? You lived a good life. I could take you down there. I could show you. So they go down, all the way down the divine elevator to H-E double hockey stick. And Mr. Epstein is looking into the gates of hell, and it's not at all, 
not at all the, the picture that he imagined. He was expecting devils and pitchforks and lava and goblins. And instead, what he sees is what appears to be the grand ballroom of a cruise ship with a very long and elaborate table and well-dressed individuals on both sides. And then out come the waiters in their tuxedos with food that's piping hot. And they place the food in front of everyone on the table. And everyone's very excited. And they lift up the lid and steam comes out. And everyone's mouth begins to water. And as everybody's looking at the, at the food, it looks so delicious, ready to eat. They lift up their hands in order to dig into the food. But attached to their hands are a fork and a knife that are four feet long. And they can't eat the food that's in front of them. And so the food looks so delicious, but they can't get to it. There's no way to get to it. And they start screaming and crying. And Mr. Epstein says, Angel, I can't take the suffering. Please bring me back upstairs to heaven. So Mr. Epstein walks into the gates of heaven. And he sees once again a, a very familiar picture. He sees once again what appears to be the grand ballroom of a cruise ship with a very long and elaborate table and well-dressed individuals on both sides. And then out come the waiters in their tuxedos. Food is piping hot. The only difference is the food in heaven is glad kosher. That's the only difference. And he's, he, they, they, they come down with their tuxedos with this delicious food. They place it in front of everyone at the table. They lift up the lid. The steam comes out, and everyone's mouth begins to water. And everyone lifts up their hands in order to dig into this delicious food. But once again, attached to their hands is a fork and a knife that are four feet long, and they can't eat the food that's in front of them. And so everyone in heaven starts feeding the person across from them, and everyone is able to eat. Now, this story is very much the story of our lives. You could have two people born to the same type of background, right? Same type of family, same type of friends, same type of teachers, same economic status, the whole backdrop is exactly the same, even granted the same tools to use. One person has a life of hell. One person has a life of heaven. The difference oftentimes is in your perspective. If life is all about feeding myself and what's in it for me and what am I going to get out of it? What do you have for me? What is the world going to give me? A person oftentimes loves the life of hell. But if the objective is that I'm going to take the tools that I have and I'm going to take the background, the backdrop that I'm in, and I'm going to give to the world, I'm going to make my impact on the world around me, the person lives a life of heaven. You know, it's really funny. Funny not like ha-ha, funny like ironic. How fast, how fast the democratic credo went from ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, to give me free stuff. Give me. I deserve it. I deserve it because I'm a victim. Everyone in this room is not a victim. You're a victor. Everyone in this room is blessed with tremendous powers. Yeah. Give it up for you. Everyone in this room is a victor, is someone unique, someone special, someone fashioned by Almighty God to leave their impact in the world. In the same way that no two people have the same fingerprints, no two people were given the same mission. Each one of you is charged with a mission, with a purpose. You think God breathed the breath of life into you so you could be just like everyone else? You're unique, you're special, you're empowered, and you have what to give the world. It's about you. You can do it. But the difference is not where you come from and what tools you were given. You can do it if your perspective is, I'm going to give of myself. I'm going to make an impact on the world around me. That's the only difference. So each one of you should have unlimited blessings in every area of your life. God bless each and every one of you, and God bless America. Thank you very much.